Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, I think I know most of you in here, but if not, I'm Diane Davis. I'm the chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design here at the GSD. I also am happy to put another hat on today, which is that I am, as some of you know, the director of a program here at the GST called the Mexican Cities Initiative, and I myself have worked most of my life on Mexico, so I get super excited when we have somebody who's coming here to speak about an issue of great importance to Mexico, but of course also to us as well. I want to um, thank Paige Johnson for help and the communications office for organizing this and supporting it. Also, I see we have some of our friends and colleagues from the Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, uh, where I'm also the committee chair of the faculty committee on Mexico, Central America, and faculty from uh, who work on Mexico and Latin America more generally. So I'm, I'm happy that we might have an interdisciplinary conversation here. So everybody's here not to listen to me, but to find out a little more from Ronald, Ronald Raya, who's going to be speaking to us today on border wall as architect, architecture. I know you've seen the ads around. But I did want to say a little something about Ronald, he's a associate professor of architecture at, at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. We were talking earlier, studied with Ken Frampton at, at Columbia. Has a, started his work on, and he. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna take away the great story you were telling me up in my office, but is of course he has a new book out on border walls architecture, a manifesto for the U.S.-Mexico boundary, and that's what he's going to be talking about today. But I've noticed in looking at his CV that he really started much of his original work looking at earth architecture, which comes from his own understanding of the Colorado-New Mexico border where he came and his family, his 10 generations or nine generations of Spanish-speaking Spaniards in the, the heart of, of what we call our Southwest. So I, I bet we're going to see more of the personal threads of his own knowledge of boundaries and borders and maybe Earth, uh, but also kind of thinking a little more about the architecture of the region in his discussion today. Um, Ron, Ronald was named an emerging voice by the Architectural League of New York, and he's re received several awards, a Digital Practice Award of Excellence. I'm going to wait. I'm, I hope we're going to hear about how digital, digital practice comes in into your work as well. Uh, and the Association for Computer Aided Design in, in Architecture. Um, so it, as you can see, he's a very, he's a Renaissance man with a lot of interesting interests that I think align very nicely with not only our programs here at the GSD, but so many of the contemporary concerns that students have here about politics, the role of politics in architecture, thinking about U.S.-Mexico relations, thinking about um, creating new ways of understanding the larger built environment in which we live beyond sovereignty and territorial borders. So I think without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ronald. Thanks. Thank you, Diana, um, and thank you, Paige, uh, for the invitation. And also, thank you to the GSD for having me. I'm uh, really honored to be here. And I'm not going to talk about any of the digital work, which is, uh, but honestly, uh, the border work, my work in 3D printing, and my work in earth and architecture come from the same mother. They all are, are research interests that are stemming from a similar focus. Um, you would ask me upstairs if, if I'm from Mexico. I, I'm not from Mexico, but I, I do consider myself a borderland citizen, but a very different border than the one that you might imagine. Uh, I'm from a region called the uh, San Luis Valley, the, vice, the San Luis that spans New Mexico and Colorado. And it is uh, bordered by, of course, the border between, the, between Mexico and uh, Colorado, but also by 13 and 14,000 foot walls of mountains that surround it at an elevation of 8,000 feet. And this was the northernmost frontier of Mexico in 1848. And so there were many Mexican and Spanish land grants that uh, allowed people to settle in this region. In the, in the further, so there was, a, there was a continued push of occupation uh, in the middle of the 1800s to settle this landscape. Uh, and it's also the headwaters of the Rio, of the Rio Grande River, uh, which now defines the United States from Mexico along the Texas uh, border. And so, just to, just after 1845, uh, Texas secedes from the Union, 
and this is what remains of Mexico in the United States. And so another division was drawn within this landscape. One side of the Rio Grande is Mexico, and the other side is a contested landscape between Texas and the United States. And then what happens is there's a tremendous amount of military forts that are constructed. So there's a militarization of that border, not too dissimilar from the militarization of the border that's occurring today, but in a very different way. It's, these are American forts that are building on the, I would say, the, the confluence of, the, of a landscape of many different cultures and many different kinds of landscapes uh, coming together. The forts look like this. This is one of these forts in Colorado. They're made out of adobe brick. But they take on the language of both the Native American and the Spanish and Mexican uh, architectural typologies and techniques. But it is, it is a US fort uh, along that particular border. And there's many of them. And he, here, are these, here are these architectural references that they're, they're, they're building upon. Um, this is Taos Pueblo, which, of course, was built in the 1100s and is the oldest continuously occupied building in the Americas, a multi-story dwelling. But it's, it's this confluence, this collision, this hybrid of cultures coming together that has always interest, interested me, that border landscapes are a place of contention, and they are a place of confluence, and they are a place where identities are both defined and shared across the landscape. And so much of my own architectural work explores that as well as my research. But interestingly enough, in 1936, the state of Colorado and the governor of Colorado decided to declare martial law in the state to prevent Mexicans from coming into Colorado from New Mexico. So there were border stops that were created along the border between Colorado and New Mexico. And of course, New Mexico is well a state at that point. Um, but people were stopped and sent back to their own uh, respective state in that case, stopped from trains, stopped from uh, cars along highways, uh, if they were um, perceived to be of Mexican ancestry. And the architecture takes on a similar kind of hybrid nature. So for example, this is a church built in the late 1700s. It's a Spanish church built on a Native American reservation. Uh, so it employs construction techniques from both uh, cultures. But you'll see here in the 1700s, there's no evidence of industrial materials. The walls are made out of mud, and the logs for the roof are felled from the hills behind. The bell is cast in bronze and sand. Uh, but with the advent of the railroad and uh, lumber mills, you see how the, how the morphology of the building is transforming. Uh, it now has a pitched roof with tin uh, roofing on it. Uh, you see the cupola is now added, again, with milled lumber. And the front facade is now covered in, in lime plaster, as is the entrance to the, to the courtyard. And if we jump ahead to what San Lorenzo looks like today, it's trapped in this uh, liminal condition between all these cultures, trying to define where exactly, what is actually the authentic version of this church. So the, the milled lumber was pulled away. Uh, the flat roof remains, but it's no longer a flat roof made of earth. It's, it's asphalt uh, flat roof. There's a, a kind of romantic ladder that's put on the side, uh, I guess, to go look at the asphalt. And you'll see this very strange entrance into the building, which is milled lumber. It's the only vestiges of milled lumber that's there, but it's kind of a weird flat thing with, uh, with uh, tin, uh, sorry, with metal flashing. And the front facade is now pretty much cast in concrete plaster, freezing it in time at this moment. So it's these kind of hybrids that influence our work as well. This is a house that we designed in Marfa, Texas. And it's a house that looks at these kinds of juxtapositions uh, between Mexico and the United States and the kinds of technologies that are present in both those landscapes. It's a house entirely constructed of mud brick. The exterior is, is plastered in earth as well as the interior using cactus mucilage and horse manure. But concrete weaves through the structure to um, prevent these long spans of earth from, from moving. Uh, and also the bricks at the bottom are made in the United States, and they're, they're a, a more considered clay body and a little bit more weather resistant and also heavier, uh, but also expensive. And the, the bricks above the lintel are made in just across the border in Ojinaga, Mexico, and they're very lightweight, uh, and they're not as water resistant. 
um, but they're much less expensive. And so the building itself takes on this hybrid nature as well as in the interior as well, where all of the facilities of the plumbing and electricity are centralized in a box that exists within this larger box of traditional construction that's held together in place by these industrial materials of concrete. So these projects lie on this border between um, two conditions, and they attempt to cross paths, uh, but they also <clears throat> at times stay on each side of those technological or building or cultural borders. And this was also played out in a project that we executed called Prada Marfa. Uh, Prada Marfa is a, an installation, an art installation that sits along the desert in West Texas in a very remote road uh, on the way to Marfa and it very close to the U.S.-Mexico border that holds the 2004 line of shoes and purses. It cannot be entered. Uh, it's, not, it's not actually a store, nor was it funded by the Prada Foundation. Uh, but it's meant to speak to these kinds of conditions of rich and poor, of, of Anglo and Mexican, United States and Mexico, but also attempt to ask questions about those conditions as well. Because this is also a landscape where, while we were constructing this, people were picked up in the desert via helicopter who had walked hundreds of miles until their shoes wore out. And so these ironies and horrors are also present in a border where we also uh, often call to attention the kind of ridiculous nature of what's currently happening along the U.S.-Mexico border. I'll just point out that even the bricks in this case, the mud bricks, were cast in a cementitious mortar to reflect the kinds of uh, <clears throat> building technologies that were used by the U.S. military after 1848 in the construction of architecture along that border, because it's interesting to me that some, for some reason they trusted in the mud brick, but they did not trust in the mortar being the same material. So it has become a, a bit of a, of a cultural object and a well-known object, even though it's been vandalized every time, and the point was for it to be a kind of time capsule. Uh, now there is a foundation that preserves uh, Prada Marfa in its kind of original state as, as much as possible. So these are the kinds of considerations that led to uh, the development of this, of this book, uh, Border Wall as Architecture. And I find that the border itself is a landscape that's rich with possibilities to conceive of architecture and design uh, through these lenses. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the book today. It's a, it's a book that I consider a manifesto because it, makes, it takes a particular position that I'll talk about a little bit later. But it's also a biography of the wall and, and, and a guidebook as well. It's designed to fit in your back pocket so you can take it with you. And there's a series of stories about the wall in this biography. So you can journey with this along the wall to learn about the stories that the wall has engendered. To contextualize this a bit for you, and if you don't know, there are 690 miles of border wall already in place. So when uh, our current president, during his campaign, would announce, I am going to build a wall, uh, an audience was, would cheer as if finally someone had arrived to build a wall. Uh, it sort of demonstrated the ignorance on both sides of, of that uh, platform that there is a tremendous amount of wall already in place at a cost of approximately $4, billion, $4 million per mile. And it's made of steel, it's made of concrete, it's made of repurposed Vietnam and uh, uh, Persian Gulf War landing mats where helicopters could land in sandy uh, uh, areas or in, or in marshy areas. And also, there's a high-tech wall in place as well, made out of high-tech sensors, surveillance, aerostat blimps, motion sensors. Uh, and since 2006, over $3.4 billion has been spent constructing this wall. And it's estimated that $49 billion will be needed to construct and maintain this wall over the next 25 years. This isn't the wall that uh, President Trump is calling for. This is the wall that already exists. So to put this into an architectural context, let's think about what $49 billion can also buy. $49 billion could buy 300 Seattle Public Libraries or 204 Disney concert halls, uh, or 500 miles of the High Line. So imagine if that kind of investment was funneled uh, to the construction of, of cultural, uh, in a cultural endeavor rather than in a uh, security infrastructure that doesn't work that well, in my opinion. I'll demonstrate that here, which is 
the, the, I consider the wall an architecture for very re various reasons, but it is a designed architecture, and it's designed a place called Fence Lab that's part of Sandia National Laboratories and, and Texas A&M. And one of the ways that this wall is tested is to take a vehicle and load it with 40 tons uh, of weight and ram it into the wall at 50 miles per hour to demonstrate its impermeability. And there's a tremendous amount of money that goes into the research and design of these walls, millions of dollars, uh, in fact. But there's also research going on on the other side of the border of ways to surmount the wall. And these are some examples of that. Uh, mobile bridges that can be easily positioned and lightweight and sometimes are on the back of trucks that can park against the wall, unfold, and allow a vehicle to simply drive over. There we go. Sometimes it works very well, and, and uh, sometimes it doesn't work so well. This is a high-centered Jeep that didn't make it over. This is some of the most expensive wall that's constructed in California uh, called the Floating Fence, and it's built over the Algodone Dunes. Uh, and it's called the Floating Fence because it sits a, atop dunes, uh, but also a machine has to go around and pick it up every so often and set it back on the dunes because it's constantly sinking and responding to the, the fluctuating conditions of the dunes. There are also the horrors of the wall, which since 1994, nearly 6,000 people have died trying to cross the border because it pushes people to further extremes in the desert. And over 30 laws were waived for the construction of the wall. The Secure Fence Act of 2006 <laughs> deemed, uh, well, that law was deemed the highest law in the land. In other words, it, it uh, excuse the pun, it trumps any other act that was ever put into place. So any wildlife protection acts, Native American preservation acts, environmental acts are less than the Secure Fence Act, which, which ensures that a wall can be con and will be constructed. The wall also needs to be built on US territory, which is very difficult. It cannot be built exactly on the political border because construction equipment has to get around and put it in place. And because of the avulsion of the river of the Rio Grande, especially in South Texas, the wall is sometimes two miles away from the political border, placing private property and public lands and even a portion of a university, in the case of the University of Texas Brownsville, on the Mexican side of the uh, border wall. So it's. It's these stories that are horrific and funny and ridiculous and poetic uh, that I have begun to document. And this is a beautiful binational uh, border uh, yoga class that takes place in uh, Friendship Park. And I love this particular pose because this is monument pose. And it's a pose of these monuments, which were the first demarcation of the border in 1849. And they were placed along the border by both US and the Mexican engineers. And this, these particular monuments actually sit right perfectly on the border, half in Mexico and half in the United States, and they're maintained by both countries. So these stories, and, and I'll share a few with you a, a little bit later, but prompted me to react to them as a designer, as an architect, as someone who is just sketching and trying to work through these ideas of what this border means, and this, particularly this wall means in this context. And I put them forward in uh, a manner which I called uh, souvenirs, or recuerdos, because that means both souvenirs and memory. Because I wanted to memorialize, may maybe like the monuments in some ways, these moments where we had constructed an, a wall, and the resilience of, of people and the natural environment have reacted to that wall in very particular ways. Uh, and they build off of stories that already exist. So in some ways, I'm not making architectural propositions, although I'm documenting ways and conditions that might allow us to consider how to ameliorate the effects of the wall. Uh, so for example, in this case, a border patrol agent was documented buying a paleta through the wall itself. So he's slipping money through the wall. The person on the other side is slipping a, a frozen treat through the wall. Uh, and it's something entirely illegal. I mean, this is constitutes illegal trade by a border patrol agent. And yet, it should be perfectly normal, right, for someone in that proximity to, to do this. And so I began to memorialize these in the form of these souvenirs, uh, uh, in, these, in this case, snow globes, but also in postcards and keychains and, and board games and things like that. And in this case, uh, doc documenting this as what I call the burrito wall, where seats can be built onto the wall on both sides, as well as a cooking station where food and conversation be shared across the wall. 
and begin to think more about how the wall serves as a barrier to north-south movement, but can it serve as a facilitator to east-west movement in both cities and share this as a public infrastructure? And the reason I presented these in the form of postcards and snow globes is because I wanted to uh, present the wall in a way that disempowered the wall, uh, uh, that miniaturized the condition and allowed us to uh, further interrogate it in this manner. So in this case, uh, a binational library that spans both sides and where the wall is dismantled and dematerialized in such a way that it becomes simply a bookshelf where ideas can be shared through the wall. A binational theater where the stage is on both sides and audience are both on both sides as well. A swing in a friendship park where you can get in on one side and just swing to the other side just for a second before you're returned back to your country of origin. <laughs> or a teeter-totter that speaks to the kind of synergies between the United States and Mexico and knowing that we are two countries not at war. We are allies, but we are also dependent on each other in terms of economic trade, but also in terms of family. And what we do on one side affects those who are on the other side and vice versa. And other stories that look at the pragmatics of the wall, so not only the humanistic nature, but there is the most polluted river in the United States, flows from the United States into Mexico, and upon return back into the United States, it is the most polluted river in the United States. It's called the New River. And so it's bringing in all kinds of toxins and, and sewage and chemicals. Um, but you'll see that if we are attempting to keep out dangerous things, at that point where the most polluted river flows into basically California's breadbasket, it opens wide up and says, welcome in. And you can see the foam and the pollutants coming in. There's no wall at that point. And this is also a point in the river where people cover themselves and tie themselves in plastic bags and get on inner tubes and attempt to float, hiding in the foam of the pollutants to get to the other side. So the book also looks at pragmatic solutions that take on the budgets associated with constructing the wall, for example, the wall here that divides Calexico and Mexicali is $18 million, which is the same amount that could be used to construct a wastewater treatment plant that could actually handle this affluent. So it, brings, it calls into questions the kinds of um, proposals and, and costs and budgets that are put forward and ask questions about why do this. And what I've, what I've realized is the, the wall isn't dividing two places, in fact. The wall is placed, it, it, it's in fact one landscape that's been cut in half. And on one side, it might look like this, and you see someone's backyard where uh, the Army of Corps of Engineers has put up a 21-foot 21 21 wall, and they're mowing their lawn. And on the other side, it sometimes looks like this, where someone has built their house and used the wall as the fourth wall in their actual house. And so we begin to produce a set of blueprints that look at the building materials and the sizes of an average cost in San Diego versus a house in Tijuana. And we can see uh, that the wall thicknesses are different, the spaces are different. But in this case, you see the wall dividing. It's this, it's this um, diamond-shaped pochet that's running up and down the side of the wall. In this case, it's uh, cutting through the kitchen table. And in this case, it's cutting through the living room. And in this house, it's cutting in the bedroom. And these set of blueprints speak to the fact that the wall uh, divides more than landscapes. It divides families as well, and, and on both sides of the wall. And there are consequences to that. But the book takes a very particular position, which is derived from this quote by Hassan Fati. And I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's someone who is very dear to people who study earthen architecture, because he attempted to uh, demonstrate that you could construct housing for the masses using only mud brick and earthen vaults. But he has this beautiful quote that says, architects do not design walls, but the spaces between them. And I think this is a, the important consideration to uh, take on when we think about the wall, that, that architects should not, in fact, be involved in the design and construction of the wall, and this is my position, but we should be involved in the conversation and thinking about the spaces that the wall affects. Uh, and so just to give you a sense of what's in, in the book, and I, I, won't, I won't read the stories, but I want to tell you about the kinds of stories that exist in, in this book in the chapter called Recuerdos, which is the major chapter in the book. 
One story, for example, is called Stonewall. And really, there's a, there's a litany of stories. It just goes on about Stonewall, Firewall. Uh, so there's like 24 of these uh, different stories. But Stonewall is a story about the rockings that take place along the US-Mexico border. And the rockings are uh, people from Mexico throw rocks across the wall for various reasons. Uh, some of them are in retaliation to an apprehension. Some of it's a distraction technique. Some of it's fr frustration. Um, and there is often a response from the US side as well, which is shootings. So a US Border Patrol agent had responded to rockings. So there's about 500 rockings that take place over the course of three years. And Border Patrol agents during that time retaliated with shooting uh, 54 times and have killed the people on, sitting on Mexican uh, territory. Uh, rockings have caused injury to Border Patrol agents and their vehicles, and in two cases, have taken down helicopters by rocks hitting the helicopters that patrol over the border. And one response to that by the US Border Patrol has to create a set of baseball backstops where they can park their car and be safely behind these uh, baseball backstops. So these are erected by Border Patrol agents along the border wall. And this is a story that I call Field of Dreams, because to me it's interesting that they've taken on these baseball backstops and really have begun to implement them in the construction of new walls as well. So these are places where the Border Patrol agents can stop behind every now and then and park their cars. But in some instances, these backstops are right against communities um, where Border Patrol agents can have conversation. It's usually with children because children are out and about. And in one instance, um, there's a story about uh, these children who were who were always given candy by the Border Patrol agents, and then US Border Patrol was told not to do that any longer. And the children became frustrated, like, why aren't you giving us candy? And then the Border Patrol agents started teasing them, and it went back and forth. And so the kids started throwing rocks. And they were, um, you know, this could escalate into a very dangerous situation. So in part of these architectural musings, I just wondered, well, why not instead of that, instead of shoot, set up baseball backstops where you could invite kids into that landscape to play baseball. And it, it's, it's less a proposition than a series of questions, because probably my biggest question in this case would be, well, what if someone hit a home run? <laughs> Maybe the Border Patrol agent would just pick it up and toss it to the other side. So it's not only cars and, and rocks and maybe baseballs that are going over the wall, but there's many kinds of projectiles that cross the wall. And to me, it's interesting. I, I think of the wall as a very anachronistic medieval technology uh, that doesn't do much. But it, just as in medieval times, there is a resurgence of medieval tactics to surmount the wall. And so in this case, we, we find many trebuchets or catapults being constructed to launch bales of marijuana over. And more powerful are these cannons that take compressed air from the vehicles and shoot uh, uh, packages of, of marijuana uh, you know, s several hundred feet over the border. And these, are, you know, these packages that cost like $44,000 each. Um, but there has been speculation uh, in the same way that during medieval times, bodies were launched over walls uh, using catapults uh, as a type of, of warfare. So the diseased, diseased dead bodies were often launched over uh, walls. But there has been a man, much speculation if human, humans were being launched over the US-Mexico border wall as a form of, of uh, facilitating immigration. And this show, uh, Mythbusters, maybe you've heard of it, attempted to take that on, that question on, and it constructed this enormous catapult and attempted to launch a dummy that weighed 200 pounds over a fictional Canadian uh, US wall that was all barbed wired in the show and everything, as if there's a wall between the United States and Canada that has barbed wire, much less. Um, so in the show, they launched this dummy, and they, they said, well, you can launch a dummy <laughs> over a wall with a giant catapult. But we don't, we don't think it's safe. And so that was their, <laughs> that was their conclusion. Um, but, but in fact, uh, there has been someone who has been launched over the US-Mexico border wall in a cannon. 
and he's the record holder for the distance, uh, uh, the distance record holder for being launched over a cannon. And he was given permission by U.S. Border Patrol to do this, and they created a port of entry for him at this net, so long as he held his passport in hand as he went over this wall. And, um, I'll let you watch. I don't know if all of you caught that, but they said, why did you jump? And then he says, and I think with an affected Mexican accent, for money, I get paid, um, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> The next story uh, is called Wall e Ball. And volleyball has often been used as a way to bring people together uh, along the US-Mexico border. Uh, <clears throat> but it's interesting that the sport is being used there because I see it as a sport that um, reflects the kinds of relationships between the United States and Mexico, and somehow the game of volleyball is this game of equality. In fact, its origins are in a game of equality. The inventor of volleyball was a classmate of James Naismith, who invented basketball. But uh, the inventor of volleyball thought that basketball was too difficult a sport. It wasn't a sport for everyone. He wanted to make a sport of equality. So it's interesting to me that all these years later, that it is beginning to be used as a sport to bring people and it's kind of a sport of equality, but also it's a sport that has origins in Mexico as well, I would say. And this is the sport of ulama that's played in many of the states uh, in the border region. It's one of the oldest continuously played sports in the world. And one thing that's interesting about this sport is that players have to keep a ball in play over just a line in the sand using only their hips. And this is a very heavy rubber ball. And so they whack it over this line. And this game can cause injury and has been known to even cause death. And so I think these relationships between uh, violence and pain and suffering and equality and recognition of attempting to surmount a line are present in, in both of these sports. Um, and I mentioned that the sport has been played for some time. This little bit of a low resolution photo taken in the 1970s when the first uh, game of volleyball was played in Naco, Arizona, Naco, Sonora. Uh, and you can see maybe that the, the wall is tilted slightly to the Mexican side because the, the wall is designed in such a way so people can't climb over it so easily. But in fact, Mexico won that first game of, of binational volleyball. And it's been played at the Fiestas Binacionales ever since. And I wanted to point out that there's the wall. And for some reason, Tecate got the ability to span both sides of the, <laughs> the wall. Um, and I mentioned how I'm interested in the, the wall is not only a, a, a political construct, <clears throat> and, uh, but it's also emerging as a cultural object, I would say. And, and we can see this in commercials and in media. And I don't know if you've seen these two commercials. They're, they're really weird, but I'm going to play them for you. The time has come for a wall. A tremendous wall. The best wall. The Tecate Beer Wall. A wall that brings us together. This wall might be small, but it's going to be huge. <laughs> You're welcome, America. You can hear all the references to Trump, right? It's a big wall, it's a tremendous wall, it's huge. Uh, but what does it mean when the wall, which is a, which is a construct of violence, begins to enter into our own uh, uh, cultural identities? And this is, OK, this, this next one is much more offensive. And so uh, I didn't make this commercial, just so you know. But I think you should know about it. 
black Angus beef and bacon? So Tex. Fire roasted peppers and onions? It's Mex. Let's settle this. When Tex meets Max, it's a win-win. The Tex-Mex Bacon Thick Burger, only at Hardee's. There, there's so many offensive things and beautiful things going on at the same time, right? Should we tell him it's both? Like, it's both. Uh, but then, he's, he's not, not yet. Like, just wait. And then he gets whacked in the face. Um, One more little story about, and maybe this refers to entering into our cultural lexicon, which is in one episode of The Simpsons, the residents of Springfield decide they need to build a wall around their city to keep people from outside their city from taking their jobs. And so Homer Simpson sa says to his daughter, I share your xylophobia. And he says, no, dad, you mean xenophobia. Xylophobia would be the fear of xylophones. And Homer says, I am afraid of xylophones. It's the music you hear when skeletons are dancing. And so what if, in fact, the wall is nothing more than an, the biggest xylophone in the world that could be played across nations and in binational performances? Um, but in fact, there are musicians who are taking this challenge on, like Glenn Wayand down in Tucson, Arizona, who plays the wall as a percussion instrument. In fact, he calls the sticks and mallets that he finds weapons of mass percussion uh, in reference to the weapons of mass destruction that propagated the construction of the, of the wall after 9-11. He calls this project Sonic Anta, and Anta means uh, end of a frontier. And this is my memorial to, to Glenn. And he often invites US Border Patrol agents to play along with him. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about just one more story, which is called Invisible Wall. And I'm, not, I'm sure you're familiar with the work of this artist, Ana Teresa Fernandez, because her work is sort of going viral. But it's simply with a bucket of paint that she attempts to match to the, the color of the sky. She creates an incredible weapon for what she calls erasing the wall, incredible tool for erasing the wall. Uh, Borrando la frontera, this work is called Erasing the, the Border. Uh, and and you see her painting it here, and it makes an amazing effect that, in fact, the wall has been erased. And this is in Friendship Park on the, uh, on the beach of Tijuana and San Isidro. And what's interesting to me about this, uh, there's several things that I talk about. One is that <clears throat> there's, there's another irony that's uh, present here, which is the residents of Tijuana love this project so much that they protect it. They don't allow anyone to graffiti on it or anything. and so. Uh, one could imagine that if, the, if a president ever came that said, we must tear down this wall, the residents of Tijuana might say, let's keep this particular moment, which reminds us of the moment that Ana Teresa erased the wall. But I think in some strange ways, uh, the kinds of activism through design and art that's taking place along the border is coming full circle. And I don't know if you saw, but last week, uh, the Department of Homeland Security announced uh, the eight proto wall prototypes, uh, most of them approaching uh, $500,000 a piece that were constructed there near Tijuana. And they're in this kind of uh, liminal zone between these triple fences that they have there now. But there's one particular wall that caught my attention. Because Donald Trump wanted the walls to be uh, big, fat, and beautiful, I think, is what he said. And the, and the call for proposals actually called for an aesthetic consideration of the wall. But this particular wall is interesting to me. And I wondered if the designers of this wall had co-opted Ana Teresa Fernandez's work. And to think about how that kind of activism came full circle, and now it's being employed as a, as a weapon. Um, I don't know if that's the case. It's just my, my own speculation, but I think it's interesting that they chose that particular color at a time when her work is receiving a tremendous amount of attention. Uh, but then I thought of uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson's quote, every wall is a door. I use this in my book because it suggests that every wall, in fact, can be overcome in some ways. And so I'm very 
I, th I think that even these proposals open up new opportunities for activism that will demonstrate how we can dismantle walls. And we see this happening. So my own proposal for the border, uh, the burrito wall, where food brings people together. A couple of weeks ago, we saw JR actually construct this and bring people together on both sides of the border. Uh, and he did it in this guerrilla way where he did it without any kind of permission and brought people together to eat along the border. And my proposal for the Binational Theater was recently uh, uh, took place in between Douglas and Agua Prieta. So I'm, I'm very confident that while wall construction is going to continue, that what will also continue are the, the ability for people to come together uh, in a form of, of binational agreement that the wall, in fact, is not a, a good idea. So I couldn't help when these walls came out in the, in the New York Times to think that each of them cost $500,000 a piece, but I'm wondering if they will pass the $200 ladder test. <laughs> All right, you can find more information at borderwallsarchitecture.com. Thank you. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you all for coming, everyone who, hey. Very nice. Good to see you. Does anybody want to start? <clears throat> okay. Please, in the front row there. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation. This, you know, we're in, living in such a dark time and need some irony that isn't just sarcastic, but makes light in both senses of the word. So this was just beautiful. Um, I was really struck by, um, your use of the materiality of this wall um, for an architectural practice that is in some ways intangible or is your kind of curatorial practice is relying upon an intangibility but using these very tangible elements. And I don't know if that's over explaining your work, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about your thoughts on that. Uh, are, you, are you commenting upon th them being um let's say, propositions that exist on paper versus? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think your discursive project, but your, so to, your very deep use of these uh, aesthetic material objects to make the points you're making. Yeah, I, I think, as I mentioned, I'm attempting to use the same kind of, let's say, cultural object condition to communicate the ideas of what's happening on the border. And so there's, an, uh, there's a whole array of these kinds of very familiar objects and constructs that I use because my, my hope is that this is really a teaching tool because what I found is there's an, uh, that no one really knows that there's a border wall. Uh, so I, I lecture all over the country, and everyone's surprised. They're like, what? There's a wall there already? Why are, we, why are we talking about this? And then when you demonstrate it doesn't work, they say, well, not working? Well, why are we going to build more? And so for me, that's important that it becomes very accessible. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't show some of, the, some of them, but there is one that's a board, I call it a border game. It's, it's silly like that also. But <clears throat> basically, you are a series of characters, and these characters represent the, <clears throat> basically the kinds of people, families or individual males of certain ages, uh, that attempt to cross the border on their own or with the assistance of, of a coyote, for example. But as you move on this border game, you have to pick up a card. And the card basically tells you uh, or explains to you the kinds of hardships that take place during that journey. So everything from dehydration to hunger to being bitten by a rattlesnake to much more dangerous kinds of assaults that take place. But ultimately, you're returned back to your start. And so it's just sort of an, an instructive sort of game that allows you to understand that it's extremely difficult to make these kinds of journeys, but to also make assumptions about those who have made those journeys. Yeah. Well, it's not really a wall. It's more like a fence, and it's only 650 miles, so it's less than a third of the entire border. So we know you want to erase the wall, but does that mean that you want to erase all immigration laws? Do you feel that you can just have unrestricted flow between, across the border without any regulation, that uh, nations aren't uh, any longer to enforce their borders or to have an orderly flow 
of uh, migrants across the borders in both directions. I mean, this is a kind of utopian project you have, so I don't know how far you extend it, but uh, yeah. there's a question then of uh, whether it's just the wall you're trying to eliminate or whether you're just trying to eliminate any type of uh, border flow controls of any kind whatsoever. Yeah, those are a lot of good questions packed together. I think uh, the way I'll kind of tackle some of them are to say that, you know, I'm I'm not against security. I'm, I'm certainly not against security. I think that's important for for people on both sides. What I think is important is that we smuggle design to these these border regions because these are the fastest growing regions in the United States, and they're some of the most impoverished regions in the United States. So if we're funneling money. If the government is appropriating funds to these landscapes for the construction of a wall, there's a tremendous amount of taxpayer money going towards that. But in terms of its, its functionality as a useful tool against immigration, it's not very effective at all. Even US Border Patrol agents will admit that it's nothing more than a five minute speed bump in the desert. They have a, they have a formula called, that they call border calculus. And basically, it, def it allows the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to define where the wall is put in place, given certain urban or rural conditions. And what they have come up with is that a barrier can create a five-minute delay, which exponentially increases the chances of someone being uh, caught, fundamentally. And they also see that natural obstacles like rivers, for example, or, or, or that same kind of obstacle of, of five minutes. So I wonder, in these cases where, let's say, for example, the, the Rio Grande River no longer runs for vast stretches of its distance. It's completely dry for various reasons, for using it, over consuming the water from the river in, in very wasteful ways. Why that, for example, is one solution, why we don't consider uh, improving our riparian zones that are shared by both countries as a kind of security measure that would benefit both countries rather than spending tremendous amounts of money uh, importing steel from China to construct a wall that is highly ineffectual. It's easily climbed under, it's easy to go over, and it also is not only at a cost of taxpayer money, and your money and my money, but it, at a cost of human lives as well. And I think I would rather see uh, money go towards improving people's lives and saving people's lives than hurting people and hurting basically the natural resources and some of our most important uh, um, heritage sites in the United States. Maybe I'll jump in here with a question. Um, Susan? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about the migration issue as well. So a couple, just a, a comment, a couple comments and a question. I guess what, what really, well, I love the presentation. It was beautiful, funny, poignant, creative everything that I think we try to do here. Um, so it becomes clear from the kind of ways you use the wall for these artistic interventions that you want to kind of educate people about the wall, but also it kind of reveals the symbolic nature of the wall. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking about that when you mentioned security. So it's not, you didn't use the word security at all in the presentation just right now in response to this, even though the Trump and others will say security. but. You, you very effectively showed that this is not any, will not do anything about changing movement across the border with the catapults and people going over them. So the language of it is the security border kind of moves people away from the real symbolic meaning of the wall from the perspective of someone like Trump probably, mm -hmm. is it's the, 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 to reify the separation between the countries, mm -hmm. right? So that's a symbolic position. It's not really about security, and it's not like there isn't flowing back and forth between the countries. So I th what I love about so many of the art artistic projects or the activation projects is that you're responding to symbolism with symbolism. So I think that's a really powerful idea. So the question I wanted to ask you, thinking a little more, and I, I also, I don't want to like open up a can of worms, but having done some work on the, um, well, the Israel, Palestine, you know, with very similar intrusions of kind of barriers, security barriers, with different languages of talking about them. They have, I'm just wondering how far. So the first question is whether you have other experiences with other artists or other contexts in which similar types of um, 
proposals, projects have been developed. So that's the first question. And the second one is, um, I'm thinking as an urbanist who studies mostly cities in the global south, but also in the United States. So in every city, especially as inequality increases, we have boundaries and borders and walls, but they may not be as visible as this, this wall. And I'm wondering, sometimes they are gated communities, etc. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how the, the kind of your approach to thinking about the symbol, revealing walls for all their the symbolic meaning and the work that they do and don't do, whether you could think about these projects in the context of cities that don't physically have one of these like barriers, but there's so many social and other spatial barriers. Whether we could take this set of ideas and projects that are focused on a very iconic place in our kind of contemporary political, political moment, but use them in other areas where there are where there's exclusion and there were their boundaries yeah. and things like that. Yeah, that's a that's um, those are a lot of questions to think about. But just to build on that last one, is as you can imagine, there are, are many critiques to this work for various reasons. Uh, one of them that I'll point out is that. Um, one of the critiques that I often receive is that for an architect to participate in this work, uh, you endorse the violence that the wall perpetuates. Uh, and I understand that position, uh, and it makes sense to me. But I also think that, that there is a missed opportunity there, and that we, we cannot think of this as something that we walk away from and ignore. And so I, my answer to that is often, if I'm suggesting that we, br we bring an investment of design to these borderlands in the terms of parks and public works and infrastructure that extends beyond the security infrastructure, uh, I also, and, and someone says that, well, you're endorsing the wall then if, you, if you're going to do this. I think it's similar to, let's say, thinking about those same kinds of programs, parks and public works, in landscapes within urban environments that also perpetuate violence because of their design. And so we shouldn't ignore those either. But would we take that same approach? Would we say, well, there's a really poorly des designed housing block next to a series of highway overpasses, extremely dangerous for various reasons. There's drugs going on there. There's killings going on there. And would we as architects say, well, we don't want to design anything in that landscape because we would be endorsing the kind of violence that, that uh, those designs are perpetuating. I, th I think we would take the opposite position. And so this is why I say we must take this position at the wall, in fact. We must uh, begin to consider this, the spaces in and around that wall and on top of the wall. And even in some cases, I suggest we keep stretches of that wall for repurposing. Right. Yeah. I just want to cut you off, but I'm thinking now yeah. just push a little more. Um, in a way, what I loved about the, well, there are many things I loved about your presentation and the work, but I, what I love about it is, in a way, the um, insignificance of, I don't want to say the in insignificance of the architecture, but th all the projects were social projects. You, you create some kind of architectural platform for changing social relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the things, at least from my reading, the food, the seesaws, et cetera. Uh, obviously, there's a kind of experiential and a visual that underscores the common humanity of people on either side, the common um, activities they're engaged in. But it's really a social project. So I'm thinking about then in American cities, and this is a big debate we have here. So maybe between the designers and the planners or something. But in a way, the least thing you want to do is create a new ar architectural infrastructure in places. So how do you think about designing, w designing not for the object, but designing for the social relationships and conditions that that object reveals or puts on the table for discussion? Because you also really, the point that you make about this is an educational project for us to think a little more about the wall. It's not really a design project, right? Or is it? So I guess I I'm, I'm pushing you on that. But yeah. can you talk a little more about the relationship between the, the social objectives of these interventions mm -hmm. and the architectural object as kind of the, the, the end product? Right. Um, well, I, I talk about a bit in the book that in order to build the social project, 
and, and its manifestation in the form of architecture, we must build social capital. And so if we can build that social capital through bringing people together and establishing these places where, where these kinds of, um, let's say, events and programs take place that are social programs, we can then begin to build an architecture that reflects this kind of uh, uh, these social conditions. And ultimately, in my opinion, uh, architecture uh, has primarily a social agenda. Uh, but it has lost that social agenda to a capitalistic agenda. The wall itself is fueled by a capitalistic agenda. I mean, certainly it is, it is a symbol, and it has been a symbol uh, only recently as a symbol of immigration, but first it was a symbol of terrorism. Right? The Secure Fence Act of 2006, which put in place the majority of this wall, over 600 miles of wall, that was a wall to, that, when George Bush enacted it, was to protect the American people from terrorism. That's why that wall was put in place. It was not to do with immigration. There were, there were no terrorists coming across the border from Mexico into the United States, nor have any terrorists ever been captured coming in from Mexico to the United States. But yet the wall is uh, being expanded, wall construction. And so the rhetoric has changed during this administration. The rhetoric is now that this is a wall to prevent immigration at a time in the United States when net immigration is zero. Uh, and that more people who stay in this country are coming by plane, usually. Uh, and, and so I think that it's, you know, in some ways, you, you asked, is this a design project or an educational project? I think it's, it's both. Why, why can't it be both? And why can't, uh, why can't knowledge lead to the manifestation of architecture and design? I would personally love to see libraries being constructed along the border or parks or, and I think we have to remember that we, we actually can do that. that this might be a way to think about immigration reform, not through the construction of walls, not through the construction of laws that keep people out and separate families, um, but through design. We've got some more questions here. I, ju I just have a question about walls in general. I mean, I'm thinking of the Berlin Wall and this wall are there. I mean, what are the differences in walls that keep people out versus keeping people in? And is, or are they just the same thing? Right, they're the same thing. I mean, are we constructing a wall to keep people out or are we constructing a wall to keep ourselves in? I mean, that's, that's also a common uh, debate. But it, there, there is a debate upon the economic val validity of keeping immigrants from the United States in the United States who contribute to our economy and who also make it very difficult, because ultimately, immigrants have desires to go back in many cases. And they contribute financially to their countries of origins in many cases. And so there have been, they're not my arguments, but there are some economic arguments that say perhaps this, these walls are constructed to make it more difficult for people to uh, contribute to their own countries and keep them here for, the, for uh, the economic improvement of this country. So that's kind of a, a walling in. But walls are constructed for different reasons. I think what's unique about this wall, which differs from, say, the Palestinian wall is that this is a wall between uh, friendly countries uh, and and um, and that makes it very different uh, a very different uh, and the Berlin Wall as well and what I think about what I think is interesting about removing walls like the Berlin Wall is that it has left scars and those scars have in some cases been really interesting opportunities to create parks or to stitch communities together. And so again, when I would say that there are critiques, like why would architects engage the wall if, if the critique doesn't allow, um, if, if, if the only suggestion is, well, it must come down and there's, n there's nothing else, we, there's no other option, it just needs to be removed, then I think that that is a little bit, um, uh, I, th I think that falls short of the, uh, what would we call the responsibilities of a designer, because the designer should, in fact, imagine what to put in its place, uh, because something has to stitch those communities and landscapes back and ecologies back together again. Are there any other questions? Yeva, you don't have a question, our expert on medical services across the border. Oh, yeah. Put you on the spot. Yeah, I have a question. Um, first, thank you again. That was wonderful. Um, I have a question about the structure of the book and how you ordered some of the souvenirs. 
Um, was there a process that you went through to like establish the order? Because some of them are very serious um, and seem to be like legitimate proposals. Others are humorous. And how do you make sure that not all the proposals are taken in jest? Um, do you, in my experience of reading it, and I haven't gone through every single one, but in the first half, say, I feel like it kind of oscillates between something that is disheartening and something you learn that surprises you and then something that's more lighthearted. And is that intentional? I guess just how did you structure and order them? Well, that's that's a really good question. There was lots of <clears throat> lots of versions of trying to structure them. Everything from there was a time when this was an alphabet uh, from A to Z of wall stories. Uh, there was a time when the book was structured from east to west, and it was really a journey that just walked us across that landscape, telling these stories. Uh, <clears throat> But ultimately, I wanted to stitch the stories together so that they could be either read one after another as a continuous story, like a continuous line, even though ge geographically they weren't a continuous line. Um, but they could be read from, you could, be, you could enter the book from any point and have a different experience. But also, the, as you mentioned, they not only move from like disheartening to enlightening, but they also move between uh, fantasy and reality. And what was very interesting to me is that often the reality was much more crazy than the fantasy. And I wanted to put people in the experience of moving through this world, not understanding if they were in reality or, or not. And so that's sort of how I began to stitch these together. Because you don't, you actually don't know, is this real? Are they, are they really launching people over the border? Is this real? Wait a minute. Is there really a library on the border? Uh, so you, you don't know. The library seems like the, the, it's the most, the library is the most fantastic. I mean, it probably would never happen uh, in reality. But the crazy thing is launching people over cannons. But that has actually happened. And so this is the kind of story that I wanted to weave. <laughs> Thank you. Well, at the very beginning, you said that Diane asked you whether you are a Mexican, and then you said you're American. So I guess like you come. Did I say that? I don't know. I don't think I, I said heard, that. I heard I you say that. I don't think I said Maybe. what I was. <laughs> um, anyways, like, I guess <clears throat> being now in the US, your perspective is somewhat from the side of the border. And I was wondering, in your research, how much you were able to integrate the other side, in a way, um, mm -hmm. and how you think this is now reflected in your book and in the proposals you make? Yes. Well. Um, that's a very good point. The, there are four contributors to this book um, from very different perspectives. So I asked them to give a reaction to, to various chapters that I wrote. And so some are geographers. Uh, uh, one is a, a Chicano studies professor from USC who lives in Tijuana and works in the United States at the university. And so I wanted to put those into perspective from different vantage, but someone who's traveled walls all, all around the world, so he's not just a US-Mexico uh, border wall expert, but he knows about walls everywhere. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to give various vantage points. Uh, I, I certainly didn't give a, a platform to someone who endorses the wall. Maybe I should have. Maybe that would have been interesting to do. But I, I will be honest to say that maybe in my own in my own cultural position, I, f I feel like I can navigate a, a bit between both worlds. And so I didn't necessarily take on, I don't, I don't know if I look at it from the other side or not. I mean, it's hard for me to make that judgment. Um, but what has surprised me maybe is how well received it is along the border. I didn't, I didn't know. This, this was a very kind of personal endeavor that I was just taking on. I was working on the border, especially in Texas, uh, on architecture projects. But I didn't know how it would be uh, received necessarily. Um, and so thus far, I've been very happy to see that people get it. People understand uh, its importance. People understand its importance to engage in this topic, especially as architects and designers. And to reveal, I think for me, the most powerful reveal is that the wall is not working because it's bringing people together. It's not serving as a, div a divider or a repellent, but people are coming, flocking to it from both sides to, to understand that 
uh, we are one kind of landscape and one culture that has a gradient, of course, maybe of, of, of ethics and morals and skin tones and, and languages. But ultimately, at that point where the wall is inserted, there's no difference between one side and the other. And fundamentally, uh, the wall is highlighting that. Um, and, and I think that pushing that's occurring by people coming together will ultimately push it, push it over. Um, that, then we can break for coffee and cookies, but um, I guess a couple things I have in mind just to share here. Uh, I mentioned to you that I'm doing this uh, class in Hermosillo with students, and Hermosillo is the capital city of the state of Sonora, which is right south of the border. And when we were there, and I mentioned this earlier, that um, there is a sense that from people, we had people and our students are looking at like work and the history of the region that languages, cultural traditions, typologies, et cetera, are very similar on both sides of the border. And a lot of people would argue that there's kind of like a Sonoran identity that transcends the physical border. So my, my one thing just for us to think about a little more, I think your, your work inspires me to want to know a little more about the quotidian lives of the settlements ar around the border historically mm -hmm. and wh whether these types of interactions how how many interactions there have been uh, mm. around what and why because in a way when you said that by the the paradox of of your projects is that you bring unite people across the border rather than dividing them because you pull them together to recognize the symbolic intrusion of the wall and you have activities that link them but i'd like to know a little more about the kind of history of the region with respect to the border. I know some scholars are working on that, but that would also inform this larger debate, how we have like government sitting in Washington and making decisions about our nation and our boundaries and borders without any understanding of the, the kind of regional history of the place and the role of the border. Um, and, and, and the last thing that I would say, then it, it actually loops back to your own history. When you mentioned that your family grew up in a part of our nation, now our nation, that was constantly divided and subdivided and somehow transitioned into, actually faced division, but also transitioned into kind of interaction, et cetera. I think that's also a hugely powerful part of the project that is a part of American history generally. The Southwest has the unusual um, sovereignty line drawing several different moments with several different wars, et cetera, going back to the Louisiana Purchase. But I do think that's also a part of the educational project of American history, not just at the border, but going up to the kind of center of like the places that voted for Donald Trump mm -hmm. are really in, have these legacies of these other ways of dealing with and transcending borders. Right. So I think. Um, I'd like to hear more about that in your next book. Maybe you yeah. will write back and 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 then last, just one architectural mm -hmm. comment that maybe thinking about building an earthen wall as you started the talk with the history of the region that you grew up in. Going back to the pure symbolism symbolism of it, it doesn't have to be a barrier so tall. If it's just playing a symbolic role, maybe going back to the vernacular um, architectural forms that you looked yeah. at. In, in the Southwest and bringing them back to the border since it, it's not going to stop people catapulting over it anyway. Yeah. So maybe you have another project and yeah. come back and well, I'm, I'm, talk to I'd be that. never interested in, in building a, a, a wall as a, as a proposal. And in fact, I'm very critical of, in the New York Times uh, about uh, seven years ago, they asked architects, famous architects, to come up with a version of the wall. And in fact, Anton Predock, who's an architect a very well-known architect uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, designed a wall that he declared would be rammed earth and built with immigrant labor, and there would be these hot rocks with a hot plate underneath them to make a, the wall look like a mirage, but they would also burn the people who were trying to cross it. I mean, it was crazy. It was great. I'm very critical of him in the book, and he actually emailed me. He says, I'm really sorry about that design. I didn't know it was so offensive. <clears throat> but it, it's kind of turned around on me, because in the, in the book, I tell a story about um, 
the uh, Organ Pipe National Monument, which is a wilderness. And in wilderness areas, there are no motorized vehicles that are allowed. In fact, no motors whatsoever. By, by federal standards, a can opener constitutes a motor, and you cannot bring a can opener into a wilderness, technically. And I know this because I used to be a wilderness ranger. But <clears throat> in that particular wilderness, they built the wall through the Organ Pipe National Monument, and that prompted a uh, border patrol agent, because they're given authority by the Secure Fence Act of 2006, to go off-road to chase people. And so there are now like 300 uh, ad hoc roads in that wilderness. And so I proposed an intensive re-planting uh, uh, of cactus along those major roads, which made this thing that looked like a wall. And so I get also th these things like, well, why is he saying this about Anton Predog building a hot plate to stop immigrants when he's building like this crazy cactus wall? Uh, but really, I'm just exposing how ridiculous it was to build that wall in the first place and how it created all these roads in the wilderness, and that what we should really do is invest in restoring that national heritage site. Mm -hmm. But it, it, in fact, looks like a crazy wall made out of cactus. But that's the point because I want to reveal those ironies and the ridiculous nature of this whole thing. Great. Well, thank okay. you so much for your presentation. Thank you for coming. Thank you.